Yo. Hey. Can you hear me? You listening to Hashtag Hashtag W-A-W. What a week. Welcome back. It's another episode of Wow, What a Week. Now, since a number of people and collectives are trying to create a good impression leading up to the end of the month, we thought we'd do something similar. We wanted to create a more positive and possibly more benevolent impression than usual. Now, we don't have a fleet of expensive vehicles to drive around in, or lots of t-shirts to throw at people as we drive past them. But what we do have are some guests who might just get you to expand your horizons a bit more. Welcome back to Wow, What a Week. Yo. Hey. Can you hear me? You listening to W-A-W, what a week. Now, our mover and shaker this week, we almost didn't want to invite. Not that she's nasty or anything. It's just that she's the type that might make you feel inadequate, even if you're good at what you do. But we figured that, at the least, we'd pick up some tips up on multitasking and how to be resilient. Please give a wow welcome to businesswoman, writer, MC, image consultant, um, message coach, and all-round healthy living advocate, and the girl with the good hair. Make some noise for Kia Mufukeng. Hey, Kay. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Thanks yourself. Yo, so... <laughs> It's, it's, it's amazing how we are in such a small world because you just reminded me that we partied together in Pretoria in Menlin. Yes. Just care to tell that story quickly before we, <laughs> we get into your real story. So you used to play there every Sunday? Uh, yes, I think I had a residency at um, 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 Rocket. A Rocket, Menlin, yes. yes. And um, I saw the post that you, you'll be there. Yeah. And then because I love your music, especially the drums. Yeah. And so we'll just do the normal things on Sunday and then have our supper. And then around half past nine, because I don't live far from there, I'm literally two minutes. Yeah. And then, then we go just to listen to you. And then, and then it was October, it was your birthday, we wish mm. you a birthday, and I was like, mine is next week. It's about two, three years ago, right? This is two years ago. Yes, yes. Yeah, and then you're like, oh, really? Um, bottles on me next week. And then my birthday, and it was on Sunday, and yours yeah. was on Sunday, the previous week. And so I came to you, I just looked at you, and you were like, I promised you something. Yes, like, yes. You, you gave me that, you owe me look. <laughs> And, and I was like, yes, it's my birthday today. It's like, yeah. okay. Then you call the waiter to, to give us our to, drink, to sort, you out. to sort us out. And yeah. And then like seeing Dorella, she disappeared. And, I never saw and her again. I last, I last went there when you stopped playing there. I was yes. only coming there for you. Ah, uh, okay. I'll, yes. I'll make sure I have another booking at Rockets. I, 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 could, I, I can only dance to your music. All right, well, I'll make a plan so you can dance for me. How are you doing? I'm awesome, thanks. Kiddy Borny. Yes. But spelt the wrong way. Why, was your, why is your yes. name spelt intentionally wrong on your book? Um, it's actually spelt almost right. Okay. But it is... But how can I put it? People back home. Yes. If you, if I can take you to my hometown now, yes. you'd be like, why are these people calling you? I, I was going to say, yes. you're, you're a Zulu girl. I'm not a Zulu girl. Oh, you're not a Zulu girl. No, but I'm, you're I'm born. So in, ah, so you're born and raised in Kenya then. Yes, Guamashu to be precise. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, from as early as I started, from as early as I knew myself. Yeah. As well to Kiriboni. Oh, wow. Kiliboni. <laughs> Tibloni. Kiliboni. Ukiri. You know? <laughs> so, when I started school, because my mom was not there, yes. her sister's husband took me to register. Sure. And then she regist he registered me in Ukiriboni. Oh, wow. So, from grade R yeah. that we have now, which sure. was preschool at the time, my name was Kiriboni, and I was using my mom's sister's husband's surname. Jeez. So everything was wrong mm. until I only saw my, 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 my birth certificate when I was in high school. I was okay. like, oh, so this is how my name is This spelled. is who I am. Yes. yes. Yeah. So even then, people were just calling me that name. How did you get to Kia? 
so when everything happened, everything, all the journey of my life happened, yeah, yeah. I, I decided to just change it because mm. now when I got to Gauteng, people were like, hey, would you born in yeah. <laughs> okay, now I didn't even know Sutu. Yes. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Sure. I'm like, so you don't know what your name means? Because mm. I would ask my mom, what does that, my name mean? Sure. And my mom would be like, go and ask those people what, what do their names mean? Oh, wow. But I want to know. So only when I got to Gauteng in 2013, people yeah. were like, hey, Udi like, No, mm. my name is Gidibon. No, no, no. Uboni Ing. What does it mean? Sure. So you don't know what your name means. Mm. So, you know, I started. You know, I, I didn't like the name. I love the name, but I didn't like the name okay. because of everything that I had gone through. So you realized that you've been living your name yes. when you found out the meaning of your name, yes. which means I've seen it all. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I've seen it all. I've been through it all, yes. in, in yes. essence. Yes. Tell us about life in uh, Guamashu Township. Oh. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up in a dusty street of Guamashu. It was sure. dusty then. Um, yeah, they've developed now. And um, I grew up in a small community called the Island because sure. we're in between the river and a railway. Mm. And I grew up a, a different girl. I was so different, looking so white in a black community, sure, sure. speaking Zulu, very tiny, like I was very tiny. You're still tiny, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up there and um, I would say because that's the life that I knew, that's the life that was in front of me. I didn't know no other. Sure. I, I could manifest, I could, you know, wish for more that when you get a chance, you go and watch TV next door. When they've sent you to go and charge their battery, only then you'll be able to watch TV. Mm. But it will only be the series that we watched and, and, and stuff like that. And then you'll be like, oh, I wish one day, you know, I could have this. Sure. Now we were staying in a back room. Mm. My, mom, my, my, my mom's sister's house, we were staying, we had shacks there. Sure. So that way... That way we grew up, mm. and I was raised by my mother and my grandmother, who was fairly old. Sure, yeah. sure. She 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 had retired because she was working a, um, she was working as a maid. Mm, mm. So she raised us, and my mom my mom was there, but my mom was not there. Sure. Yeah. Now your book mm. is a reissue. Because your book initially was Rise of the Phoenix. Yes. You've now changed it to Pain to Purpose. To purpose. Yes. Why did you do that? Both of them were correct. Sure. I still rose above mm. um, everything mm. that was put into me. Mm. But when I had a meeting with, now we had, now we had a publisher, the first, the first one. Um, it was self-published, sure. um, but I did have a um, few people that were helping me, like Botang, mm. because he he's also a, a, an author. Sure. So sure. I also spoke to him. Um, he helped me um, with, you know, you have to. I didn't know you have to choose the paper. You have to choose this and that. Mm -hmm. So the first one was the Rising, uh, the Rising Phoenix, sure. and then then when we sat down and changed the cover, mm. uh, we were like, okay, there's too much pain. Mm. Um, because the guy who's a, who's a, a publisher um, uh, got a first copy mm. of the the, the 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 first draft, and he was like, "There's there's too much pain sure. in this story. Mm. Um, can we change? Yes, we ro you rose above everything, but can we put pain? Mm. So we changed it, pain to purpose. Sure. Yes. Why do you feel pain to purpose? almost better tells your journey? Because with the pain that I went through, mm. I feel like it molded me mm. to be where I am. Um, I feel like a person who was, you know, when a person, they throw stones on you. Mm. I took all those stones and I started building the house that I have now, mm. which is me, which is Kia, sure. which is a new version of myself. Sure. Yes. Mm. So that mm. pain, it did not... You know, I didn't, I didn't go with the flow to say, this is a thing. These are the things that I went through. Maybe mm. I should have diverted sure. and and did the things that even the community thought I was going to do. Mm. Now, your mom forced you to turn into a little entrepreneur from an early age. Yes. Um, tell us about those painful years. 
uh, you're not even 10 no. and already you were forced to go out and sell mealies. Yes. Yeah. Um, at first I wasn't forced. Mm. It was a matter of you see your mom do this uh, and you want to copy, yes. you know, oh, let me help my mom. Mm. Until she would go for so three months and six months and you're like, okay, we don't have food. Mm. <laughs> and I'm only with my grandmother. Mm. Um, I did have my brothers, but they were not there. The older brother was in exile. The other one was a taxi driver. So he had his girls and, you know. Mm. So it was just me and my grandmother. That was before my the last born was born. Mm. And... I remember this one day we didn't have, like, there was no food at all. Mm. And um, because we were staying in a, it's, it was like a communal because there were shacks and then there's a house. So when people are washing pots, preparing to prepare for dinner, they would soak maybe ipapa and stuff mm. like that. Mm. So you just go and camp there like, can you not soak it off? Can I just, mm. you know, have that? Mm. Because then you're not going to sleep with water. Mm. That's the only thing that is available. Mm. And then I was like, no, I, no, no. We're, we're not doing that. No. Mm. So I said to my grandmother, that's, um, help me because I didn't know how to use the, the, the oil. Mm. I was like, okay, help me with the oil. Let's, let's do the peanuts. Mm. So we did the peanuts. I knew how to make millies. Mm. We'll go and get the woods and then order millies and then we'll sell in the community first. Mm. And then you go and stand by the train station. Mm which was not far from where we lived. Mm. That's the only way that um, we could get food. Sure. So I couldn't just sit and say, oh, just because Umama is not here. Mm. Um, in my mind, I'm like, okay, but she has taught me, even though she didn't sit me down and say, do this, do this, but I would help her. Mm. So me helping her, I was teaching myself the trades. Sure. And then I took it upon myself to say, you know what, me, I don't want to get hungry. Let me do this. But then your, your journey into entrepreneurship, as it were, then had you realizing that you have to go door to door selling meals and, and going into people's yards, as it were, or to other people's shacks to sell meals. And yeah, carry on. Remember in the location, there are mm. those mamas that carry brooms mm. and then they. And dusters. Yes, mm. and then they. they, they, they they don't go house to house, but mm. they will be, you know, mm. screaming mm. Chanel and stuff like that. So they're like, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, this needs a, you know, mm. a personal face to face mm. engagement. So then I started doing that. Then I will come back from school, prepare peanuts while preparing the millies. Mm. And then I will go house to house and sell before I go and, 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 and stand by the train station. But it was when you started going door to door that you started dealing with being sexualized, being groped. You're still a child mm. having to deal with all of that. Tell, tell us about that. Um, so you would go, let, okay, door to door, it was, it was milli meal. Mm. So you go, 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 sanbona ninjani, and then this one time and I'm, and I'm alone mm. I've got my cousins but one of the I guess it's one house and mm. you know one of the assorted mm. I'm not and and I hated poverty and I was like no 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 me I'm no I'm, mm. I'm, not, I'm gonna get myself out of this mm. so they say <laughs> <laughs> um, so this one time I go it was a yard full of men and you know I'm selling a uh, milli meal and then this guy's like okay bring bring mine into the house mm. and I did you know honestly so and then that's when the first molestation started because mm. he's like for me to buy this you need to do this to me mm. I was like no I don't have to mm. he was like we are to pay you know you're pure mm. so you have to do what I'm telling you to do and you can't tell anyone because no one is gonna believe me. Mm. Okay. And then then you it started with one person and then 
now when you when you sell you don't go to that house because you are scared now mm. and then i asked my cousins to you know to come with me mm. but because bona they thought Uti, they were better than everyone they would just stop outside mm. the gate because mm. they don't want to be seen mm. Uti, they are selling millies mm. so they didn't know what was going on inside and you couldn't we didn't have what we have now which you can talk to your parents you can talk to this you can talk to that mm. so i kept on bottling all these things that were happening to me all the molestation mm. um yeah the first rape paper when i was nine nakona i sent to go in, buy the book in, in fact i was gonna say i mean your mom sent you to downtown durban yes, when you yes, were nine yes and uh, that's where you were first raped. Yes. Do you care to tell us about that journey to Durban? Um, so there was a book that was needed. I was in Standard 3 then. Mm. And my mom was like, okay, just take the train, mm. uh, jump off a Peria station. Go I knew where the peanut, well, I knew where we used to buy peanuts. Mm. Um, and then on that street, just walk down, you'll see Adams and Greeks. Mm. Okay, that was, that, was the, that was the direction, go. So I went, okay, I'm giving directions. So I kept on walking, and the Adam Sim Greek is right at the end. Mm. So I keep on walking and I'm not finding this Adam Sim Greek. Mm. So I'm thinking maybe I'm lost. Mm. Then I asked another lady, the lady said she doesn't know where it is. Um, I asked another lady because you can't ask men. Mm. And then the lady says she doesn't know. So I kept on walking. I think this guy was following me. She, he saw that I was getting lost. Mm. He's like, where are you going? Maybe I can help you. I was like, no, I'm looking for Adams and Greeks. Mm. He's like, I can take you there. Mm. Okay. So I kept following him and then he just grabbed my hand and then he went into a very dark building. Mm. And then that's where the rape happened. Mm. And now I'm this tiny little thing. I'm trying to now walk down the stairs, mm. dripping of blood. Mm. No one is there to help me. I'm alone. Mm. Until this old mama saw me, because uh, I was wearing a dress, so you could see, mm. you know. The blood. Yes. Mm. And, yeah, she, she stopped, she took off her jersey, and then she wrapped me, mm. and she asked me what happened. I couldn't talk. Mm. I was, I couldn't talk. Mm. You get home, and then mama says what? So she takes me home, and then she tells my mom. And then my mom takes me to a doctor. There was Dr. Gabashi. She, he was there at the station, examined me. And um, of course, you got taken to the police station. They check. You open the case. You have to now explain Uti, how does this person look like and, and, mm. and, and so forth. Um, and then the next day, I was back at the station selling peanuts and did, did you ever discuss it with mom? Did she ever ask you anything? There was, to be honest with you, I started having conversations with my mom, I think five years ago. Mm. <laughs> Just five years before she passed. Mm. We never had you sit down and say, oh, ma, but this and this and this, you mm. always be dismissed. Mm. You know, you all, like we never had like a talk to talk, like mother and daughter talk. Mm. No. Is that the reason you had Udu do an Nkanyiso in your life? Pardon? Do do and Nkanyiso. Is that why they were in your life? And tell as us my, about as my imaginary friends. Yeah, tell us about Dudu yes. and, <laughs> and the role they played in your life. So those were my imaginary friends mm. um, that I used to talk to to calm me down. And and everything that I wanted in life. Mm. You know, I'd be like, but I want a, um, you know, I want a house, I want um I want shoes. I didn't mm. have shoes. I was mm. walking barefoot. Mm. Um, in a way, it was, when I look at it now, it was like my manifestation. It was like I'm talking to the universe because those people never existed, mm. but they were in my mind. Mm. I was able to talk to them. Sure. They were able to calm me down. I'm like, mm. this is what happened. What do we do now? You know, and those little voices mm. in my subconscious mind, they'll just throw in, you know, your, no. op your options. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so they were there in my mind. Mm. They were there holding my hand. They were there, you know, for me to leave. Mm. I think if I did not create them or if they were not there, I don't know what I would have done. Maybe I, maybe I would have done, or I would have died on my first instance uh, mm. when I tried to kill myself, mm. you know, 
but they were always there, constantly mm -hmm. tell me that, telling me that everything's going to be fine. The, the reason I ask you about uh, Dudu and Kanyiso is because there was a patch I went through in high school mm -hmm. and where I wasn't sure if I'm coming or going. And I had an imaginary friend. And I'd sometimes sit under a tree yes. by the soccer field. Mm -hmm. And I'd have conversations and I'd answer myself. Yes. And I look back and I realize that there's actually benefit, especially as a child, mm. if there's no one else you can talk yes. to, to have that imaginary friend. Yeah. People might think you're mad yes. or that uh, this child is going through whatever they're going through. Yeah. But sometimes you need that sound board, you do. even if it's your own mind. Yes, you do. Do they still exist in your life right now? They do. Uh -huh. They do. Um, what do you talk to them about right now? <laughs> um, about life, mm. uh, about life in general. Sure. I still, I still, I still have my me time. I lock myself in my room mm. and I have my conversations mm. with my imaginary friends, mm. and um, we we put the structure together. How sure. we strategize? How are mm. we going to? come out of the situation that we are in at the time, mm. you know? Sure. So even now, it, mm. it does help me mm. because um, as much as I do have now your, your, your psychologist that I attend, mm. I, have, I have support, but sometimes there are things that I just, you only feel it yourself that when you think of telling somebody else, they're going to say, we are shy, man. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, there's a moment reading your book that I laughed out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your first trip to Joburg, uh, you were 12 when Mama sent you to Joburg uh, over the school holidays. Tell us about the disastrous trip to Joburg. <laughs> so, it was actually... It was actually after the 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 the, 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 the rape incident. Yes. I think there was a mistake there in the book with the with the with the with the ages, because mm. it was just after the incident ah, of okay. rape. So you were 10, 11 then. Yes. Okay. And then then my mom was like, "Hi, I'm your goal. Your policy can't. Mm. So police are not kind of you. My mom is supposed to exactly. be dealing with the. You are the clinic. You know. Yeah. Now she just writes me a shawelo. A piece of paper, shawelo, and she puts me in the bus. Wow. With umpago, cheka, and chicken, and mm. my two liter, off I go. Mm. I get to Baragwanath, and the driver's like, where are you going? So I give him the paper. Mm. He's like, okay, but there's no address here. She sure. just says shawelo. Mm. Um, then he takes me to the police station. So I spent my three days at the police station. Those were the best years of my life. I felt healed because these people had guns and I felt mm. so protected. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh. And um, So you spent, what, two days at the, three police, days three at the days police, police station? Three days at the police station. Because nobody knew where you were going. Yeah, so but, but where, you, they dropped me. Yeah, carry on, carry on. They dropped me there, mm. and then the police took me to Shawelo. Sure. And my mom expected me to know where Shawelo I knew I'd gone with her, mm. but I didn't know where to jump off. Sure. Now, there's a difference when you are in a taxi mm. or when you are in a car. Mm. Now, she expected me to just jump into a taxi and say, I'm going to Shawelo. I'll see where the bus going? stop where mm. I'm going. Mm. Luckily, the, the police that, 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 that I was dropped at... Um, they were both from Durban. Another one was from Lamonville, a lady. Mm. Another guy was from Guamashu. Mm. So, you know, that three days, I felt, Uti, I have parents. Because mm. I had this, they were not jollering or anything. They were colleagues. But I had my mom and dad who mm. were police. And I was like, you know, in my mind, you know, talking to my imaginary friends, like, mm. yeah, now you are protected these people are going to catch these people. Mm. They're going to kill them. Mm. You know, we started playing all these things because they will hold my hand and we walk here. Like, I've never felt so protected that three days. Like, oh my God. You mm. know, I was a VIP. Mm. You know, these people were like my, my blue lights. Mm. <laughs> mm. So then they call the, 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 the radio station and then they... So, so you're on Radio Zulu. I was on Radio Zulu. This with lost child. This lost child. <laughs> Uki Riboni. <laughs> And then when I came back, they bought me so much um, umpago and they yeah. gave me money. Mm. So when I got back, you know, you know, when you're a child, mm. it didn't even click. I was lost. 
I was just happy to see I had police that were like looking after me. Mm-hmm. I've got money. I've got umpago. Like, so why are you still mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I was lost. You're supposed mm-hmm. to be sympathizing with me. Oh, my child. No, mm-hmm. no, no, nothing. Mm-hmm. It was like, we carry on. Yeah, life, life, life moves. Yeah, on. life moves. That was mm. that was my mom. I don't know how she was. Um, I, I don't know because um, mm. I even tried to take her to the psychologist. So I mean, you need to sure. handle other mm. situations mm. in a good manner. Mm. But yeah, until on her way on on her last days, that's when we started having our mom and daughter. We started finding each other. Yes, started mm. finding each other, and and and. But still then, yeah, she even took it to a grave who my father was. Mm. So, yeah. I, I was going to say, I mean, one of the, 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 the themes that I pick up in the book is the fact that you never get to find out who your parents are no. or who your father my is. My father, no. Um, because the man that was given the handball, whose funeral you attended, didn't look like you. No. His kids didn't look like you. You are light skinned. You were skinny. Yes. You had the hair, and none of his family looked like that. No, 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 nothing. In fact, he was. I was sent to him. I was sent to another one, and then, um, then my mom sent me to now his brother. He's my so-called father that passed. Oh yes. To go live with him because yes, because yeah, yeah, he was living in the suburbs. But they started molesting you also. It was actually rape. He, mm. They started raping me, him and the son. Wow. So that was the most um, tragic thing because when I left, you know, M. John Dolo, I thought I'm going to the burbs. Mm. Um, you know, Life will be better. Yes. Mm. There's running water. There's a toilet inside the house mm. instead of using the pit. There's a television. There's a television. Mm. You know, no one is sending you to go charge the battery and mm. stuff like that. Mm. Little did I know that... I was going to hell mm. and and I bottled it mm. because now you are constantly told, number one, you've got a low self-esteem mm. because of how you look. Kids are constantly telling you, Buguti umubi. Mm. By the way, I grew up knowing Buguti mm. umubi. Like you are the most ugliest girl. Mm. You've got this teeth. Mm. They used to call it izinyolenja. Mm. That when I started having my my medical aid, I went to I wanted to remove it because mm. you know they were constantly telling you who oh, did this. So I had a very low self esteem mm. growing up. Mm. I didn't trust myself and stuff like that. So I didn't tell anyone. I bottled everything. Mm. Now before we wrap up, because I want people to read the book, I don't want to give away a lot <laughs> from this book. But one thing that almost gave me hope in your story was when you met Mawawa. Yes. Uh, Mawawa is a boy you meet um, in high school that understands that you've been through a lot, yes. waits for three years before you guys even uh, get intimate. Yeah. Um, you guys fall pregnant the first time you have sex. Um, my firstborn also happened the one time we were careless, but anyway, there's a story for another day. And... One thing that broke my heart about your journey with Mawawa is when he started changing. When the first time he beat you up simply because you called him out on a girl he was dating. And uh, there's something you say that he apologized and it seemed genuine and he promised never to do it again. I believed him and forgave him. Little did I know this was the beginning of my career as a punching bag. Yes. Um, Until this day, I still believe Uwutin Umawawa. That guy loved me. Mm. Genuinely so. Mm. Um, There's no one who can come from the burbs and be nursing a girl from M. John Dolo and, you know, not and, getting some and... And defying his and, parents. Yes. Um, but when I said, when I was actually doing the book, mm. I I realized, Uguti, the mistake that we made was when the, when the child was born, mm. staying with the parents and mm. especially the mother, 
when she saw how he was treating me, mm. you know. She, she, enabled, came, she enabled it. Yes. So mm. to to her, you know, Zulu people and Moti, to her it was like, mm. you know, I've bewitched the sun. Mm. Because the sun would do everything. I, I only used to breastfeed mm. my child. Mm. He would, when the child cries at night, take the child from the cot, open my titi, let the mm. child, uh, change the child. Like he did everything, washing of the clothes of the child, my clothes, mm. like that guy even washed my panties. Mm. So when the mother he saw that- He helped you wash your grandmother's clothes. He helped me wash my- were, when you were yeah, in high school. He was the most sweetest, per mm. sweetest person on earth mm. that even my grandmother's, you know, grandkids, mm. they never did what he did. Mm. He would help me wash my grandmother. Mm. He would help me. Yo, that guy was so loving. Mm. He was he was everything. Mm. But when the mother saw how he was treating me. That he was a gone guy. <laughs> it, it never sat mm. right with her. Mm. It was like, because I come from a poor background, mm. maybe I did things to the sun. Mm. And because she was a sangoma, mm you know, busy with herbs and stuff like that. Mm. Till this day, I still, not that I believe, he, she used to bring Muti every Friday, mm. but mine will be on the side mm. for me to take. I'm like, but I don't, we don't use Muti at home. Mm. But they say when you're in Rome, you do what Romans do. So I complied and I was a child, mm. you know, and, and I couldn't report to anyone. Mm. So you talk about a career as a punch and bag, but you've also, tried to take your life numerous times. Why do you think the good Lord is refusing to take you or to allow you to leave? I think, I think God had a purpose mm. in Biloyami. I think there's so much more that I still need to do. Mm. There's a lot that I have done. Mm. I've helped. I've helped so many kids. I've helped. Um, I've mentored a lot of kids. Mm. I've raised so many kids. I started raising kids when I was when my when my brother was born, mm. when my my little brother was born, when my other brother passed when I was 23, mm. left leaving four kids. Mm. I became a mother to them. Um, you know, I took care of all the clan. So I think God had a purpose in me to help these people. Mm. Hence, he didn't want me, no matter how much I, I tried to kill myself, it didn't mm. happen. But with each molestation, each rape, each failed suicide, what conversations are you having with yourself? What conversations are you having with God? The one time I had a very heated conversation with God, mm. literally. Mm. Because now I was going to two churches. I was going to a Catholic church and I was going to Zion where my grandmother used to go. Mm. And um, on Wednesday we used to attend it's now called home sale in these in this oh, verbs, yes, but yes, we used yes. to call it Tiketang. Sure. So every Wednesday, different uh, religions, mm. we meet, we go, prayers. Mm. And, you know, I used to pray a lot. You, get, you, you guys even did that on the train? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when you wanted to know to carry one of them, like, you can say my Roman, I can't allow us as I own, you know, I can't allow us on that cool. You know, I have a church game, long I'm shame. You know, I was that kind of girl. Now, I had a conversation with Uncle Uncle Lugutine, Haibo. How can I be your good servant? Mm. I, you know, I, I do good by you. How can you let me mm. in the hands of the sharks, in mm. the hands of everything that has happened to me? Why are you not protecting me? Exactly. Why are you not my father? Because I pray, I, you know, I'm holding your flags with both hands. Mm. Why are you not returning the favor? Mm. And I think in my head, he kept on telling me, he kept on giving me faith. Mm. And I think faith is the one thing that has kept me, sure. that has brought me to where I am today. It's through faith. Mm. Because even now things are still happening, but I have so much faith that my friends will be like, but I'm gone. I have faith. Mm. Once I've told Uncle Uncle this is what I want, mm. I believe he will provide. Sure. 
Why did you write this book and who should get this book? So this book is for everyone, mm. um, young, old. Mm. Um, it's, it's everyone, moms, dads, even kids. Maybe from the age of 12, mm. even kids can get this to see what he, you know, you have everything that is in your hand. Appreciate it mm. because there are kids that grew up in, a, in very dark alleys like, mm. like I did. Um, so appreciate what you, your parents are giving. You don't know what they've been through. Mm. You don't know what they are still going through. Mm. They might not tell you, but they are going through a whole lot. Mm. So this book, it's a cocktail of all the drama. It's a cocktail of everything that we face, in, but mine is a movie. Mm. It's, it's just a movie. Mm. So it, it, it's, a, it's an inspiring book. Oguti, whatever you go through, you might think, Oguti, this is the end of it. But when you take the right direction, mm. when you don't lose focus, Oguti, but this is where I was heading. Sure. Yes, I fell. Mm. This happened. Mm. I dust myself, I go back to my focus. Sure. I don't divert to say, oh, okay, just because Uguti, this and this happened. Mm. Um, I must just let me change and do other things. Because mm. I could have, with everything that I went through, people were, they were telling me in my face, mm. Uguti, you know, you're going to be a prostitute. Mm. You're going to be a drunkard. You go, mm. And then I was like, but this is not what I want. Mm. So I didn't do it for people. I did it for myself. Mm. Because I grew up in a family that I was going through all those things. Mm. And it was like, no, no, I don't want to be a drunkard. I don't want to be, this is the life that I want for myself. Mm. So through my journey and everything else happening, sure. my focus was where I was going. Sure. Even when I would try to end it all. Mm. But my, when I would dust myself, I was like, but you, you were focusing on something. Mm. Continue focusing on that. Absolutely. So I kept on doing that. Mm. So... This is an inspiring book of, we go through a lot. I'm, I'm sure when people read my book, there's no one who has read my book and not, um, you know, felt something or never been through anything or knows of someone mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. been through that. A lot. Everyone relates. A lot of young girls, especially in townships yes. and rural areas, go through a lot that we'll never hear about. Yes. They often take it to the grave. They do. Uh, they often become different people because of what they have had to endure. Yes. And I don't know how we protect little girls such as yourself from going through what you went through. Because I don't see it stopping. It's, yeah. I don't see it stopping. I think if we can have in the communities, because mm. our parents are busy. Mm. They go to work early in the morning, they come back, they are, they are frustrated with their mm. work. Mm. They don't have time to talk to us, mm. you know? And that's why you find a lot of kids, you know, they kill themselves and, and, and because there's no one to talk to. Absolutely. You know, mm. so if maybe schools or communities were to create a space, a safe space where kids come coming from school and then they go there, where there's counselors, where they, they talk to strangers, where they are open to open up. And, you know, the levels of unemployment don't help because now you have all these uh, men who are sitting doing nothing or drinking. Yes. And then you have a girl who can't go to school because she's on her period, because she can't no afford one. pads. Exactly. Now she's also fair game. So it's just this vicious circle of, that is going around. Of yeah. just, it's, it's, it's I, I, I don't know, I don't have the, the solution, I don't have the answers, but we have a big problem. We do. We have a massive time bomb and little girls and boys are not safe. No. And they're not safe by a mile. And I don't see anything changing anytime soon. I'm sorry to sound as negative as I'm sounding, but your story is one of a million stories. And I'm glad that you've come out on the other end. Despite whatever challenges you might still have in your life, I'm glad you've written the book. And I'm hoping it will shine a spotlight on, we need to do something and do something fast. Mm. We can't have little people growing up like this. No. We can't. No. Where do we get the book and where do we support your business? Because you're also an entrepreneur. <laughs> 
Um, so the book at the moment, um, you get it from myself. We do yeah. Korea. Okay. I am based in Pretoria, okay. main lane area. Um, but we do Korea. We're just waiting for these bookshops um, to give us a go ahead to shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to be shelving very soon because it's, it's a process to, sure, to sure. shelf with them. Um, so at the moment, you get it from myself. Um, I am on, um, on, on Instagram, the underscore real underscore kia okay my kia is k-e-e-y-a okay. so it's the real kia with underscores in mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. um that's on instagram on facebook i'm kia mofukeng okay um and then the number that you can reach me on is zero six five nine three zero zero nine seven one Okay, what's the number again? We'll also put it at the bottom of the screen, okay, by the way. Okay, it's 065 9300 So, yeah, that way you can reach me for the book. Um, I also have um, a spa. I run a spa. A wellness spa. A wellness, it's not, a, it's a wellness center. Uh, not sheep. Uh. <laughs> not a shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your wellness center it's a, is it's in, a wellness center. It's, it's in Menlin. It's also in Menlin. Okay. In Pretoria. So we've got a branch in Pretoria. Mm -hmm. We've got a branch in Durban. Okay. That uh, just opened six months ago with the one in Durban. Okay. Um, but this one is opened six years ago, mm. uh, the one in Pretoria. So I'm also a massage coach. Mm. I do power of touch mm -hmm. um, seminars mm. where I teach people how to touch themselves, not each other to touch themselves oh, okay. so that when they go out they they know how to tell the oh, other yes. how and where I want to be touched because they know themselves it makes a lot of sense yes so yes. it in know thyself mm. because you can't go there and say yeah, she was the one rope I was the exactly. one auntie but do exactly. you know yourself exactly. do you know where you want to be touched so now I must guess what you want exactly you and you go out and you tell people oh but do you know when? Exactly. As, so I do those seminars mm. where I teach people how to touch themselves. Okay. Now, it came from from what I went through mm. because with all the molestation, all the rape and stuff like that, mm. I became very reserved of not wanting mm. to be touched mm. because of not wanting to do other things. Like, mm. no, no, no. Mm. This reminds me of. Mm. So my healing mm. process was for me to go and study these things. And now I teach people. That's sure. also part of my healing. So oh, yes. it's a, I'm a healing. I'm a healing process. It doesn't mm. end. Mm. Um, yes, you do get triggered at times when you you, you watch something mm. uh, and, or stuff like that. But I'm a healing process. Sure. So I wrote the book because I was healing. Mm. It's healing me. I'm still healing. Sure. But I believe that as a community, as people mm. are reading the story, they're going to be finding some things that they relate to. Sure. And then it heals them as well. Mm. And like a friend of mine bought the book. The mother took the book. The mother's calling, crying. Mm. I went through this and this and this with my mama Zala. You just, you know. A lot of women went through a lot as yes. little girls. In fact, a lot of men also yes. went through a lot as mm. little boys. We have a, we have a ton of broken adults yes. because that child is oh. still hurting. Yes. And yes. it's like I said, it's a problem. I, I, I don't know what we're going to do about it, but we have a big problem, we, guys. We do. We do. Yeah. So... We are out of time, though. I'm being shouted <laughs> at. I'm going to have to let you go. But all the best in all that you do. Thank you but so much. But most importantly, thank you for this book. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for this book. I'm hoping that people go out and buy it. Uh, Kiriboni, uh, Pain to Purpose uh, by Kia Mufuke and get yourself a copy. Uh, gift it. Buy five copies and give them to people that you know would appreciate the story of a young girl that went through a lot but still turned that into positivity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Kia Mufuke is about to leave the building. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me thank you. here in your studio. Um, yeah, I was a bit nervous, but yeah, thank you so much. Get the book. <laughs> this is Wow! What, what a week. What a week. Celebrity guest. Celebrity guest. There are some guests who will be recognized by different avenues. Some will say, hey, he's the guy from Carte Blanche. Some will say, he sounds like that guy from 702. Some, more mature viewers, will ponder, he looks like he was on KTV, which will lead some less mature viewers to ask, what the hell is KTV? 
whatever your reference is, you'll agree has been a notable feature in the SA media landscape for quite a while. Please give a warm welcome to Bongani, Uncle Bongani, Bongles, <laughs> Bingwa. Bongles. How are you doing, my dog? I'm well, I'm well. Firstly, I have to correct you. It wasn't mini TV. It, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't KTV, it was mini TV. Oh, mini TV. And mini TV was set up to try and do what KTV what, was what doing. What was doing. Yeah. Ah, okay. On the old TV one. I remember. The previous yeah. CCV. Was that it, was, CCV was the previous TV2. It oh, was the TV2. Yeah. You're, how old are you? You're turning 50 this year. I am. What are you looking forward to about 50? Yo. Based on what your perceptions of 40 were, and that you've now done 10 years of 40s, what, what are you looking forward to about the 50s? I'm looking forward to being younger and older at the same time. Okay. My father, when he was my age, was a considerably older man. Yes. Perhaps he was also wiser, but yes. he was considerably older man than I am in terms of his physical appearance, his sure. demeanor, his perspective mm, of the mm, world. Mm. And I think what we are learning as our generation, we are younger at 50, but because we're more open to the world and how yes. it's changing, I think we're wiser. I was reading a meme the other day. Uh, someone posted it. He's in his 40s. He's like, guys, so we are the adults now? <laughs> Who trusted us to be the adults? <laughs> we get called into the meetings. We get to make the decisions. You're the uncle now. I am the uncle. I am the... No, wait. I'm... I'm. So a lot of my nephews and nieces who already have kids... Yes. Call me... Uh, uh, Tatum Kun. Exactly. You know, as in the, grand, the, the, the grandfather. Absolutely. It's insane. How wild is that? But, but also, the fact that we're still young at heart, we even look younger. We, 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 I mean, you... We dress younger, we speak younger, we think younger, we eat younger, we listen younger, we party younger. Some are even dating younger. <laughs> As you must if you're single at 50. <laughs> it's the one perk you get. <laughs> to get to 50 and be single, it is the one perk you get. Because everybody else your age... Yes. You, of course, are always the exception to this rule, mm -hmm. but everybody else your age has got a whole lot going on that you don't want. Absolutely. At 50. Absolutely. Now, when I asked you to um, come have a chat with me on uh, Wow, What a Week, the first thing you said was, why? <laughs> why would you say that? Because my whole career has been around the people I interview. Sure. They are the story. Sure. I have worked very hard to not be the story. Mm. And I always I always used to point to Derek Watts as an example of this. Sure, sure. When he appeared on your television screen on a Sunday night, if he said anything, you trusted it, you believed it, mm. because he said it. Sure. But who he was on Monday morning, on Tuesday afternoon, on Thursday evening, you really didn't care. He was never the story. And we had no clue also. Precisely. Mm. You know, and 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 he was just the trusted voice of broadcast news. Mm. And that's what I've tried to do with my life. Sure. And so I thought, what would, have you run out of guests? <laughs> A year into it <laughs> already. <laughs> the thing is, majority of the guests that I interview are people who, who I'm a fan of their work, of their minds, of what they do. And because I'm a fan of your shows, and because I've been a fan of yours since you're on Channel O, because I never watched mini TV, uh, because I think by the time mini TV hit, I was either at boarding school or at varsity. So I've been a fan of your work since uh, the Channel O times. And I almost feel like we grew pretty much at the same time, yeah. parallel in the industry. Because as Channel O was this brand new baby on, uh, on TV, YFM Y was the brand new baby on on. on Correct. On, uh, on radio. And then uh, Simunye was also the, this new kid. So I almost feel like we're a generation that reshaped what youth culture was. In fact, in 1999, Channel O yeah. went on its first nationwide tour. Sure. And there was a house CD. Yes. Uh, that had... Th that kept who, you guys... Uh, that, that had busy. who? Yeah. As part of the talent on it? Absolutely. DJ Fresh. Absolutely. Yeah, you may remember that, of Absolutely. course. Absolutely. How would you say those brands reshaped what youth culture became, looking back in hindsight? 
it was a seminal moment in our history. I think let's firstly put it in that context mm. because Channel O comes on stream three years after 1994, after democracy. Sure. There was this sense of anything was possible. Mm. We were that first, and we were lucky in a sense because we were old enough to remember the sting of apartheid, the yes. limits of apartheid. Yes. But we were young enough to be part of everything that was new. So mm. there was this explosion of culture, whether you're looking at Guaido, whether you're looking at fashion, mm. there were these groups that were coming out of nowhere, the bongo muffins of this world. Um, if you think about what Ulebu and Tembi and those guys were doing, mm. it was just this explosion of youth, of exuberance, of sure. hope of a tomorrow that had arrived. Mm. Looking back, do you think we fully grasped the responsibility we had on our shoulders? Let me tell you why I'm asking this. Because often people ask me about my time at YFM, and it's only now that I realize, one, how much we shaped the popular culture, but also two, how much of it we were not in the moment for, because we were on the wave we didn't fully appreciate the fish and everything else under the wave and the, the nuance and just everything else that was happening. Who does? Who does appreciate that kind of explosion? Mm. Because the uniqueness of the moment means it's likely not going to be repeated within our lifetime. Absolutely. Certainly within, you know, the generation that we are now still a part of. Mm. So you, you don't get a sense of that moment because mm. you, when you're a pioneer, there's a lot of you doing things that you're not supposed to do in the first place. You're yeah. doing things that many people would bet against sure. succeeding. Yeah. I mean, Channel O was meant to be this pan-African music channel that was sure. about bringing all of the music genres mm. that people, young people were listening to all over the continent together. Who had ever done that? And you know, before Channel O, there was only one music show that catered for the continent. It was called Rock Down Africa. And it was um, pre um, um, presented by those two twins from Nigeria. I'm trying to remember their names. Uh, pretty boys, very hunky dudes. But it was a show on Mnet. That was the only music show that catered for the entire continent. Now, that, you know that because you had a, 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 a decoder. Also because I did the voiceover <laughs> as, as a student on a budget, but I didn't have Mnet. <laughs> but, but I mean, Channel O took yeah. me to Nigeria for the first time, sure. took me to Kenya for the first time. Mm. And, and those were experiences I would never have had otherwise. Yeah. I will never forget being in Abuja sure. in the red light district, mm. or at least an area of the capital that we were told was sure. the red light district. Mm. And there was a Muslim woman who had hidden her face, um, dressed very modestly. Sure. And I thought this is the biggest contradiction I have ever seen, but we were told that's exactly what the local Muslim men needed from that kind of ah. service they still needed some veneer yes. of modesty, sure. even if it wasn't there. Those were things a guy from Mtata sure. in the Eastern Cape would never have been able to see, mm. but for that coming together of that moment. Absolutely. Memories of Mtata while we're there. What are some of your fond memories? It's Did... such a contradiction. Yeah. Because my father and his friends mm. were lawyers, were doctors, were accountants. Mm. Many of them were the firsts in their families. Yes. But some of them came from generations of people who'd been educated in mission schools, who'd mm. gone to the Lovedales, the Heel Towns, uh, Forte University, obviously. Mm. And they lived in this bubble of what the Bantustans could actually afford. Ah, yes. They knew it was a false economy. They mm. knew it was a false reality. But at the same time, they prized education intensely. Mm. And for many of them, going to do the struggle, skipping the country, was seen as something you did if you couldn't succeed in the real world. Ah, yes. And yet at the same time, they were entirely dependent on what the struggle would do to mm. free them mm. from their own complicity with the system. Mm. So mm. they lived with this guilt, and yet at the same time, they 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 built these bubbles. Sure. And 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 there was a lot of there was a lot of I'm being inarticulate, but there was a lot of there was a lot of alcohol abuse. Mm. There was a lot of philandering. A lot of excess. Um, a mm. lot of excess because yeah. they needed something 
to assuage their guilty consciences. Sure. But here you and I are sitting. I'm mm. a result of that philandering. Mm. 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 And how do you reconcile that with where you are now? Each generation is called to rise up and do something that hopefully will live beyond their time, beyond sure. their moment. Mm. We're all part of the tapestry of history. Sure. And without sounding too philosophical, mm. um, they did what they knew to do with what they had. Sure. Did your pops also drive a 230 Mercedes? He, so the first Mercedes I ever drove, yeah. I had a personalized number plate. Shut up. In homage to him. Yes. Because I used his clan name. I used to have a car called Lambolo GP. Oh, wow. I'm over it now. Yeah. Three cars later, I mm. still battle to remember my license plate yeah. because of that. But yeah, absolutely, that set. Um, one of my mother's business associates had a car phone. Yeah. Like we saw J.R. Ewing. Exactly. You know, that was a thing. <laughs> I remember growing up, my girlfriend's uncle had a car phone. I was like, you're the only car in Haburoni with a car phone. Who are you calling? But they did. <laughs> they, and who was calling them, importantly? Exactly. <laughs> I was like, maybe black folk didn't deserve money in the 80s. <laughs> but again, I think it was that aspirational thing yeah. where there were so many avenues closed to black people sure. that where you could find some kind of niche, if yeah. you were an entrepreneur, if you owned a number of you know, service stations mm. or a KFC, yeah and you sort of could throw your weight around in a sure. small town, mm. um, those were the only avenues of really full self-expression. Isn't the big irony, though, that a lot of the kids of those men and women from the 80s were also into boarding school, away from the Eastern Cape? <laughs> a lot of people were, because you must also remember that people from Johannesburg, people mm. from Cape Town, from Port Elizabeth, because of the unrest sure. that really flowed from 76 onwards, mm. they would send their kids mm. to the schools of certainly Transkei in particular. Sure. Um, and so, I mean, you know, classism is always about trying to do one step better. Mm. So a lot of these people would be able to send their kids to the St. Andrews in Gramstown or yeah. Michael House in KZN, etc. Yeah, we had three kids from the Transkei in our boarding school. Um, and we in the Transkei, by the way, had yeah. these images of what we thought Soweto was yes. or or what we thought New Brighton was in mm. PE. Mm. And, and it, it was quite extraordinary how we essentially lived this very suburban life yes. in the 80s. Absolutely. The music I listened to were Wham, Prince, yeah. Bruce Springsteen, George Michael, Michael Jackson, of course. Every artist you've mentioned there, I played at the school disco as the school DJ. <laughs> Tears for Fears. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. I mean, of course, yeah. Well, there were lot. There was lots of sort of R and B and black music. Yes, I mean, Brenda obviously, Fassi Township at the music. Time, at the time. Blondie. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. And Do you Papa. remember Overtime? Yes. When Blondie went solo, all yeah. of that stuff was part of that mix. Mm. But we were suburban kids. We were cheese boys. Absolutely. Before anybody had even coined the expression. Absolutely. You moved to Johannesburg because what happened? <sighs> it's the most apartheid ultimately was just an absurd idea. Mm. When we moved to Johannesburg, my mother wanted to try and do business here. Sure. So they had meetings at places like the Carlton Hotel mm. or the Johannesburg Sun. They used to have training sessions at the Mill Park Holiday So this Inn. is in the 80s, This is right? 1986, the yeah. height of apartheid. Yeah. Yes, things were starting to loosen a little, yeah. but if you think of Berea, Sure. or even Hilbra, mm. or Jubea think, Park. Think of Kilani today. Yes. Yeah. The first exclusive bookstore in the country was in Hilbra. Mm. I used to spend hours at Look and Listen Records in Hilbra, mm. at that corner there next to... On Pretoria uh, Street. Uh, at that corner next to Garbers, yes. uh, correct. Yeah. Um, Hilbra Records. Yeah. The movies, the new Metro, the mm. Stir Kinnacle, the first time I ever went to the movies, High all Point. of that was in Hilbra. We yeah. lived in High Point. Yeah. All the celebrities. Yeah that I would see on television, whether it was music or television presenters or actors, they all, they all lived, lived High Point. at yeah. High Point. Yeah. So, so that was the context. But how did we live mm. at High Point? 
my mother knew somebody who worked at the trans guy consulate. Okay. Because the only way you could live at High Point was either if a white person signed the lease and sublet to you. Ah, uh, yes. Or if you were part of the diplomatic corps, uh. which then made you non black South African. Oh, yes, yes. So she knew a friend who wrote a document that said she worked for the consulate. Mm. And so, therefore, we were part of the diplomatic corps and could live and essentially go to any school we wanted. Because you were diplomats. Because we were diplomats and therefore non-South Africans. Mm. In fact, in 1994, because I matriculated in 93, mm. my green ID book said non-South African. Oh, wow. Because that's when I mean, you got it in yes. the trick in those days, right? Yes. That's when you got your ID. Mm. So in 93, the change hadn't yet happened. Yes. So my ID it wasn't one said nation yet. non-South African. I mm. was a trans guy. Yes. Imagine that. How would you say life in Hillbro? You even lived in Soweto at some stage. No. Right? You haven't lived in Soweto. The first time I lived in what you would now call a township yeah. was in Soshanguve. Oh, yeah, you lived in, in, in Soweto. As a preacher. Yes. In fact, we'll get there. <laughs> How would you say living in Hillbro in those times shaped the Bongani we see now? I'd never seen drag queens before. Yeah. The biggest jamboree in Hilbra yeah. was the New Year's Eve party. Oh, yes. Again, we're talking 1986, 87, 88, 89, those years. The yeah. 31st of December, you would see drag queens. You would see this spontaneous... It wasn't a march, but we yeah. would all be dancing around the streets. The streets were closed off. There'd be music pumped in the air. It was this racially mixed crowd. There were blacks, there were whites, there were mm. coloreds, there were Indians. There were people from all over. Sure. And it was this big street jamboree. Mm. So that was the first exposure to anything of that sort. Um, again, the idea of living in this building where all the celebrities came. There was an artist called um, Jean-Michel Byron. Okay. He ended up being the lead singer of Toto. Oh, wow. In 1990, mm. he used to perform at a club in Rosebank called Jaggers. Yes, I remember Jaggers. Every night, yeah. he would be bringing a different girl, all of them white, yeah. redheads, blonde hairs, mm. brunettes, kissing them by the lifts. Yeah. I'd never seen anything like that. And I was, what, 12, 13 years old? Sure. It was literally as if I was living in New York. Yeah. It was very Hollywood-esque. That would be the equivalent of it, yeah. I mean, if there'd been a Studio 54 in Hilbra in those days, mm. it's something I probably would have experienced. I remember going to the first club I went to in Hilbra was, I think it was Pink Cadillac. And I was there with friends and there's a girl at the bar that I offered to buy a drink. And I'm just starting to chat her up. And then she went to the bathroom and then the barman says to me, I hope you know that's a guy. <laughs> and how did you react to that? <laughs> the drink was off. I was like, I'm not looking to pick up a guy. <laughs> so again, the homeland system for all its weaknesses yeah. and it was the sheltered environment. Sure. Um, because we were effectively in a police state, both mm. in South Africa and the homeland, mm. There was some semblance of law and order. Sure. Things, the buses ran on time. Yeah. Um, it Things was it, it was this bubble. Yeah. Um, In fact, you almost understand why people often say, when Mangupe ran Bob, things were better. Because things were better for a reason, because that's how the homelands were run. There's a great book by Jacob Lamini called Native Nostalgia. Mm. And it's exactly that point. Exactly that, that there's a whole generation of people who do not look, they understand politically, mm. they understand intellectually what 1994 meant for us as a people. Sure. But they also look back to all that has been lost exactly. in terms of just how a country, a state functions mm. and what its duty is to the citizenry. Mm. And they look back and they say, did we go that much forward? Absolutely. Bongani Bingwa, the pastor. What happened? I say to people, I'm as gay as the Nile is long. Sure. I'm not bi. Mm. I'm not pan. Mm. I'm as gay as the Nile is long. Mm. I had always been in Christian churches growing sure. up. Sure. Um, I spoke in tongues. Mm. I spent much of my You've done the whole habarabeda, dasha, dasha. I, spent, I, 
<laughs> I can preach a fire and brimstone message like no other. <clears throat> Are you going to do that for us? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a little, to, I'm a little rusty now. In fact, you used to preach on the church, I mean, on the train We even. used to go on the trains. Part of, part of the thing was how radical could you get? Oh, wow. Um, so we would preach on the trains. We would preach at Park Station. We would preach at Nord Taxi Rank. We would preach at the malls. Uh, public preaching. So what would a typical train sermon by Bongani go like? So remember you've got you've got a captive audience yes. who could disappear at any time because sure. you don't know when they're getting off. Mm. And you've got to make one point and you've got to make it land. Oh, is that where you learned to be a seasoned radio guy? <laughs> you must keep it to the point. <laughs> you've got to you've got to make a point, you've got to make it land, but you've also got to scare them. Ah yes. Because there's no point. Yeah. You know, you're not there to teach positivity. Sure. You're not there to necessarily enhance. You want to tell them because this is their chance with destiny. Sure. If they miss this bus, if they miss this mm. boat, They'll burn in hell. when eternity comes, yeah. whose side are they going to be standing on? Who are they going to choose? Yeah. And you've got to look them in the eye. You've got to find somebody that you've got to make that message land to. Yeah. Yeah. And then would you like to know the Lord? <laughs> So all of this is a big part of me running away from I'm a queer man. Ah, okay. it's, just, it's just something that was very, very difficult to sure. accept. Mm. And I thought if I throw myself hard enough at the church, at this, mm. and I want to become an evangelist, and I want, and again, 1994 is this awakening right of the country the mm. mandelas the sisulus everything they fought for has come true yes who says that church mm. can't achieve the same thing mm. people went to jail for their beliefs what's giving up one sexuality for mine exactly that was the thinking mm. so i ended up being a missionary and lived in such so Dealing with your sexuality as a child growing up. Take us through that journey. My first sexual realization, mm. there was a stream not far from where I grew up. We used to call it Eriva. Sure. As and, a, as a cross, I would. <laughs> and of course, we didn't have swimming costumes. <laughs> we weren't trained. We would all go and swim a river. A river, yeah. And you strip down to your briefs. Yeah. And that's when I knew. Yeah. But I also instinctively knew it was something that I could not speak about. Mm. It was something I could not tell anyone about. Mm. It was my secret and it was something that I instinctively knew mm. had to be kept kept inside did any of it was any of it accompanied by guilt of sorts perhaps confusion yeah it feels strange but it feels familiar mm. it feels right it mm. feels natural mm. but it feels also very very frightening mm. so in an, an environment where hyper masculinity was prized above all else mm. you don't speak up about that kind of thing mm. Did anyone pick it up? In standard six, mm. we're now, of course, in, in Gauteng. Sure. By that time, in standard six, I went through a phase mm. where I thought, screw it. This is what it's about. Mm. Still haven't had the conversation. Still haven't declared anything. Okay, so folks haven't picked anything up. Um, and then I watched Dynasty. Mm. And this is the thing about representation. I always mm. remind people. Mm. Stephen Carrington was an engineer who worked on oil rigs, wore gray suits, yes. could punch anybody. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's what I'll be. Sure. That's who I will model myself on. Mm. So the conversations come much later. Mm. When does the conversation start happening? When it becomes evident to me that the church thing isn't working. Okay. I was so you successfully hid until the church period. I, that's what I thought. I okay. mean, I think there are many people who would say, family members, some mm. of them who would say, but we always knew. Okay. 
we were waiting for you to tell us. Mm. Um, because, I mean, of course, I was, remember also, I was the good kid. I sure. got the good grades. Mm. I wasn't out drinking. There were no girls. Mm. So Well-spoken. Well-spoken. Yeah. Families like that kind Most of thing. Most likely to succeed. There you go. Yeah. I was the deputy head boy at school. Mm. All of those things. Any chance encounters with any other boys in that period? Or was it, I'm running, that's how far I'm running? That means you have to expose yourself, mm. you know. But we also, I mean, at, at one point I was at a boys only school. And in that kind of environment, the most, the biggest offense, at least in those days, was that you would be revealed to be this other. Mm. And I just was not prepared for that mockery. You even got married. I did. So, because again, I have to, you know. <laughs> you have to carry on I have, this. To, I have to push this thing. <laughs> so, I, I'm in my early 20s. Yeah. I come out of the church and I think, let's give this thing a go. You came out of the wrong place, bro. And <laughs> then I have the conversation. I come out, I tell everyone. And then I look around me mm. and everyone, this one has been with this one, who wants that one, who's been with that one, who... And I thought, this is not for me. Mm. And I thought, let me go for it one more time. Give it a full go. I was celibate for six years mm. before I met my ex-wife, trying to prove to myself mm. that this is something I could do. Oh, wow. And we were part of a very radical church. Mm. The, only, the first time our lips met was when they said, you may kiss the bride which in retrospect was somewhat convenient for me. Mm. Cue laughter. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm just, um, because in my it's mind- It's insane, right? You no, know, in my mind, there's a sadness I feel that you had to walk as far as you did before you realized that actually screw all of this. I always wanted a family. Yeah. It's a big part of my identity. I'm a father now. Mm. Um, I have one biological child. Mm. My ex-wife was a single mom. So my son was six when mm. I met him. Mm. Uh, he's now a strapping lad. In fact, he's in the same industry. He's a video editor. Mm. Um, he and I worked on a couple of carte blanche pieces together. Mm. Um, so that was always something that appealed to me. Sure. Um, again, my father, because of his philandering ways, mm. um, left town when I was about six years old. Mm. And I only saw him three times after that. He was dead two years before I even knew he was no longer around. Mm. So being a father was something I yearned sure. to do, mm. if only to fix what had gone wrong in my own childhood. Oh, yes, yes. So the day you decided that I'm done with this, before you tried again, what was the response around you? We told you. Mm. We told you the world will eat you and spit you out. Mm. So come back. I was the prodigal son. Mm. Um, the church community was very accepting as long as you wanted to do things the way they saw. Uh, if I walked back today, I bet you they'd accept me now. Mm, they'd love to have me, I would imagine. That we've been waiting. Right? Mm, mm. Um, not gonna happen. <laughs> how, how did mom respond? Possibly one of the scariest questions my mother ever asked me was when I got married. Mm. And she said, but didn't you say... Mm. 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 I was telling him then about it is a scary question, and we know the answer. But she wanted the kids. She wanted mm. the grandkids. Mm. She also wanted that dream. How did your being in the closet affect your marriage, if at all? Well, the one thing was my ex-wife knew. Oh, so she knew. She knew. Okay. Um, she had known before. Mm. In fact. Right, very soon after we started dating, mm. I sat her down to say, I have this big thing I need to get off our chest. This mm. is perhaps a month into the dating aspect of the relationship. And she says, oh yeah, I know. Because when we had started sort mm. of getting together, 
she's met someone you know how it is mm. you tell your friends mm. when one of whom said to her but isn't he mm. and her view was we all had baggage sure. she was a single mom mm. if this was my cross to bear mm. the you know the church would help us fix it and that was her investment and her faith i suppose and to me that made me think gosh mm. somebody who would accept me mm. even as i am yeah this is the one it's a, it's a great deal yeah <laughs> so i never had to come home and say honey we need to talk exactly or sneak out no so what happened with the marriage we lost a child mm. when our son died um he drowned in our pool mm. and when he died it there was nothing else you could take away from me mm. and i thought i had to be authentically me mm. because i had lost everything i had thought i could lose mm. there was to this day there's nothing you can take away from me mm. that was worth more to me than that mm. and i thought with the little i now have left mm. i have to make the most of this life mm. and that was the switch how did the conversation go with whom with with your now ex-wife we talked mm. i mean it <laughs> those conversations are never easy <laughs> um but but i suspect she knew mm. it was going to come at some point so sure. just yeah. a lot of time the timing was was mm. awful mm. and i think it's one of the things i live with you have to remember the time period between the death of my son mm. and the birth of my daughter was 30 days mm. and so initially i got into i'm a doer mm. so i'm with the one fresh there will never be anything more agonizing than choosing your kids coffin choose dude yeah right yeah then choosing which part of the cemetery mm. he must be laid in and not just a coffin a tiny coffin he couldn't fit into a kid's coffin you see what i mean we had to get him a semi adult casket mm. Mm. it was white i mm. remember it i can mm. see it in my mind's eye mm. This woman is almost you know pregnant she's pregnant but she's mm. almost uh, at term mm. in terms of the pregnancy. Mm. So at that point it was you sit there I'll take care of everything else. Mm. Run with the show. You organize where the church service is going to be, who is going to preach, who is going to all of that. I mean mm. of course I had help my sister and everybody else joined in. It wasn't mm. a solo effort by any means. But my goal was to help her to carry to term. Sure. she carries to term child arrives there's this whew, sigh of relief mm. but she's in grief mm. postnatal depression possibly mm. and then i come along and say actually actually listen actually mm. so it was a heavy moment it was a heavy conversation it couldn't have been anything else often when a child especially dies in a drowning the blame train is never far between a couple how did you guys deal with that i don't think i don't think that's a conversation that ever happened between the two of us mm. there was too much already happening i suppose also because the accident happened in a way that couldn't have been really anybody's fault ah okay and so it wasn't a case of you should have i should have you mm. could have i mm. could have mm. the thing that was clear to both of us and i mm. think she would agree with me even to this day mm. we went to a support group sure they were called compassionate friends mm. and this was a support group of bereaved parents sure and i remember sitting there listening to stories mm. and you know people would get up and say you know we miss michael we miss mm. johnny whoever it was and they would describe how their kids had died. Mm. And there was one particular guy whose child had died in a biking accident. So this was for us 2009 mm. and he stood up and he referred to something that happened in 1985. Jeez. And we both looked at each other and we said this is not going to be who we are. Mm. 
we understand grief shows up in different ways for different people, mm. but we're not going to be stuck in this moment mm. that years from now, this is going to be our before and after. Sure. Practically, that's what it's turned out to be. Mm. But, but the idea of blaming, the mm. idea of fault finding, the idea of being stuck with it, mm. it's, it's, it's something that's irreversible. Sure. And you've got to, and my motto, even as a father today, I'm here for the living. Absolutely. I will always hold his memory dear, mm. but I'm here for the living. Would you say, to use a biblical term, he had to pass away for you to truly start living? Or would you have found another out and started truly living? I suspect, who knows? I might have been one of those after nine mm, husbands. Mm. I might have been one. I don't know if I would have had the courage. Mm. I don't know. Mm. I don't see it. Mm. Um, so who knows? But when it happened, mm. that it happened, mm. how do you not? live up to your fullest self, your fullest mm. potential, your truest self. Mm. How do you guys then navigate the one million emotions that come with a divorce and want to start co-parenting? Divorce is ugly. The animosity that now sets in, the hatred sometimes, the anger, the I wish you were dead. No, I truly wish you were dead. Divorce is ugly. Mm. It was easier to deal with the loss of my child Jeez. than it was the to divorce. get divorced. Mm. Because the one is permanent, it is immediate, yeah. and there's a finality to it. Mm. The other is up and down. Mm. Because when you're married to someone, Oh, honey, will you pick up the dry cleaning? Yeah. Or I've got a meeting. Please make sure you are at the soccer practice. Mm. All of those things you're able to cover and sure. back each other up. Mm. When you're in that space of animosity, your schedule is more important than my... I mean, mm. anything can set you mm. off. Mm. And it is a conscious and deliberate decision mm. to be kind to someone. Sure. Everything in your head, in your heart, tells you not to be kind to. Mm. And it takes a moment. Mm. Like I was saying to you earlier on, I feel supremely blessed that we didn't have an acrimonious divorce because I've seen how ugly it gets. I mean, I, I even remember my daughter, uh, whom at the same time we were getting divorced, her friends were getting divorced, her friend's parents. I think there were about three or four in her circle of friends. And she was shocked that we were getting along because all of her friends were complaining that the parents are fighting, pulling hair out. It's, it's just... Look, what we did is our son at that point was mm. about 13. So we sure. put him in boarding school. Mm. So he never saw the drama. Ah, yes. Our daughter was very young she mm. was really a few months old mm. when it happened but i was always very clear that if i was divorcing their mother i was certainly not divorcing them and i have been the primary caregiver mm. of both kids sure um even after mm. the, the the divorce and yes the acrimony was there for a while but i think we worked through it mm. um i think you know, to this day my ex-wife and I can sit and with a glass of wine mm. and five hours passes like five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So you're back to where we can we be were very We were very quickly back yeah. to uh, a semblance of, because sure. I think once the dust had settled mm. and, and part of the reasoning was we were both young enough oh, yes. to start all over. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, she has been happily remarried mm. uh, 12 years now. Mm. She's been married longer now than she was with me, you know. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't think she would have it any other way. Sure. What lessons or experiences from your personal life would you say have come in handy in your professional life?
the truth always comes out. Mm. And the truth cannot be polished. The this, truth. This sounds like a uh, carte blanche promo, but anyway, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> this Sunday, uh, no, not quite. <laughs> the truth comes out. The truth co it comes out. Yeah. It must out. Mm. It cannot be polished. Mm. It 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 cannot be. You can't smooth over it. Mm. It is sometimes ugly. It is sometimes messy. But it is always real. Mm. And you never have to remember it. What would you say, speaking of carte blanche, from your carte blanche days, how would you say you personally impacted either people's lives that were the stories or just society in general? Because you guys, some would argue, were doing the Lord's work on carte blanche. It's a very interesting dynamic if I compare the years of carte blanche, yeah. for example, to what I do now. Sure. Um, and I only stopped doing carte blanche, by the way, mm. early this year. Yeah. But carte blanche is a very producer-driven dr way of telling stories. Mm. The presenter, in a sense, is incidental. The presenter's there to connect the dots, to help you figure out what's going on. Also to kind of be your champion, asks the question, to ask the questions you want answers mm. to. But ultimately, it was always very clear to me whether we were talking to, I mean, I've had to interview bereaved parents mm. and not make that moment about me, sure. even though their pain so deeply resonates with mine. Mm. I've had to sit across some of the most powerful individuals mm. in corporates, in politics, in a number of spheres in life. You've had to interview people that could make you disappear. And meet them toe to toe. Yeah. You know, some people, of course, will obfuscate. And we're generalists. Mm. You know, what do I know about complicated corporate structures, mm. you know, and, and, and deals? But I've got to talk to you mm. at your level. Otherwise, the story makes no sense. Mm. But carte blanche for me was always about giving a voice to the voiceless, mm. letting people tell stories that no one had ever asked them about before, mm. getting people to understand that somebody cares, somebody sees, mm. somebody will fight on your behalf. Sure. But also a carte blanche, I mean, one of the things on my bucket list was to go and see a rocket launch. Mm. I ended up in French Guiana. Mm. You know, I mean, there the were experiences I would never have had. Sure. Being in the desert in Dubai, mm. I'm terrified of birds, anybody will tell you. Mm. But I was able to be with and, and that is not guys a, who train hawks. Not, it's not a gay joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not terrified I of actually, birds. I was never actually terrified of birds, if you want to go there. No, no, we know. <laughs> <laughs> of those birds, anyway. <laughs> They'll much more readily trust me than you, Fresh. It's, Be yeah, careful what you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were saying. So it gave me opportunities. Um, you know, you could, the proverbial, you speak with princes and paupers. Yes. You know, one day I'm interviewing Tabombegi, the next I'm interviewing a street cleaner. Sure. Um, it was just that anything goes kind of show. The very big difference between that and what I do now. Yeah. When I was on carte blanche, nobody knew what I thought. Sure. Nobody knew my politics. Mm. Nobody knew my ideological bent, my approach to things. Mm. And so, whilst I think the stories we we told and they still tell on carte blanche helped to shape the country, mm. what I do now is about opinion shaping. Mm. It is about making you think a little differently. It is about giving you pause. But it's also about growing and figuring things out together. Mm. Before we leave uh, Carte Blanche, what's the one story that will never leave your, your mind that you did on Carte Blanche? There were so many. Either most memorable or most impactful, you'll decide. 
I've sat next to, I've sat across artists asking them what their favorite song, and I've always rolled my eyes when they said, it's like choosing your favorite <laughs> child until this moment. Yeah, who's your favorite um, child? <laughs> Perhaps let me say to you rather this. Mm. It's when you meet a CEO who lost their job mm. because of an interview you did mm. in a social setting. Yes. And it's, Awkward. hello, yeah. it wasn't personal. Yes. Um, it's when you're at a jazz festival. Mm. I remember this moment particularly at the Cape Town Convention Center mm. with those escalators going up and down. And I'm going up, Trevor Manuel's coming down. And he says, hey, bongles. Mm. And you know that... Why was that awkward with Trevor Manuel? Because it was, ne it was, it was never personal. Mm. You disagree with people. It's about the issues. It's about what needs to be told mm. but it's never personal mm. and i think for me that's something i can walk away from may i tell you a quick story i remember when tony and gain went to jail we did because we used to do a lot of political commentary on my drive show on 5fm we used to do a lot of skits and i think we had a whole series of skits about tony and then one day i go to a club um, in cape town st eve's and he's there and he comes laughing. He's like, I heard the things you guys were doing on the radio. <laughs> and I wonder if we've moved away from that. Yeah. Where there was a time people understood yes. it wasn't personal. Mm. Now, perhaps with the advent of social media and the amplification, you yes. could do a skit mm. on your drive show sure. and he might hear about it. Mm. Today, if you were to do something like that, it lives beyond the moment of broadcast, and it goes viral. I listen to half the stuff we recorded on 5FM today, and I'm like, how did we get away with this? Why did the SABC not pull the plug on the show? But also because it, in those days, things didn't go viral. There wasn't yes. a platform yes. for repeating and repeating. And it was repeating. heard once and it went. And it went away. Yeah, and then people spoke about it, the water cooler. And then, and then you did the next one, the yeah. next day. Would you say... there is a dangerous element to the kind of work you do. Whether on carte blanche with the exposés you did or with speaking truth to power in what you do now on Talk Radio 702. Uh, for instance, the work you do, whether it's on 702 on carte blanche, in many other countries, you'd either need a security detail or you'd have disappeared. There was a time Derek Watts had a bodyguard? Yeah. I have received... Did Derek Watts keep bodyguard in his pocket? Because Derek was huge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How are you going to protect Derek? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> With his eyes. You have to strap two guys on Derek to protect him. I have received threats. Yeah. Um, I have been sued. But, again, as you say, in many other countries, people mm. disappear. Yes. How many journalists have been killed around the world just in the last year? Look at the people who have died trying to tell us the truth of what's going on in Gaza. Mm. When you compare it to that, and, and say what you like about our political class. Mm. I've also had senior members of the ANC privately wink mm. and say, keep at it. Well done. Keep at it. Mm. You know, and so say what you like about our political class across the spectrum. Mm. We are a loud, noisy place. Mm. And we're often parochial in our outlook. And we think that we are the center. We think everything exactly. Exactly. that is big in this mm. moment, this week, is the biggest thing that has ever been. But the country moves on. And as the democracy matures, those things have mm. now been set in people's minds. Sure. You can't go back to the days of censorship and the old SABC. There's just too much mm. space for people to air what they think. You can't about. hide the truth you anymore. Can't. The truth always outs. Mm. Mm. The threats that you got when you got them, though, what was the nature of the threats? I know where you live. Mm. I know where your kids go to school. Mm. 
But often it is people who the one particular threat was a business person. Mm. These aren't things from politicians. Sure. You know, the politicians, I mean, for you to make it anywhere near mm. the top levels of, say, the ANC, you better know how to street fight. Mm. You better know how to talk your way and debate and argue your way through difficult and dense subject matter. Mm. A little piddly journalist telling a story about you that particular week is not mm. going to shake you Absolutely. in your boots. Mm. But we have this thing in South Africa where the private sector are holy cows. Yes. We see them as people who are not corrupt. How dare you expose me? And yet, I mean, you know, there has to be, if there's a corrupt person, there has to be a corrupter. Mm. So would you say it was the so-called corrupt tour that headed out for you? Yeah, because the narrative, again, is yeah. that only government, only politicians, and quite often only specifically the ANC is yes. corrupt. Sure. But corruption in politics is nothing unique to South Africa. Mm. And for any politician to be corrupted, there must be somebody who stands to benefit sure. that we look away from. Mm. Um, I haven't felt unsafe in the sense that I was not only, you know, it wasn't, the threats weren't only to me. Sure. They were also to the organization mm. that I worked for. Sure. So, you know, th those are things that in some sense you see as a badge of honor. Mm. You know, if everybody thought I was just some mellow teddy bear, sure. I'd probably be doing something wrong. How did the lawsuit go that you... Um, you when Weber Wenzel is representing you... Oh, yes, yes. And yes. they respond... Mm. You think twice before sending another salvo. <laughs> and I mean, I can't tell you the number of times we got urgent interdicts for stories not to be told right up on a Sunday, for example. Oh, yes. That's something that still happens. Mm, mm. Um, you know, but but you carry on. Mm. As I say, there are far more serious things sure. happening to journalists around the world. Mm. We can't be cowered by little legal letters sure. that people write. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's for stupid things. Mm. You know, and I mean, somebody took me to the Broadcasting Complaints Commission because mm. I used to start my show by saying to my colleague, let's light the fire, let's kick, kick the tires and light, light the, the fires. fires, which is something pilots do when they take off. Yes. But quite often what would happen is at six o'clock in the morning, that's when roads are closed with because as people are going to work, <laughs> you're throwing rocks, you're burning tires, that's when you'll get the most attention. And some listener thought it's because I said kick the tires and light the fires. Yeah. And we lost that one. But ultimately, you carry on, man. I won Musune and I lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are the chances? <laughs> and look at you now. Uh, we will we'll talk. In fact, you were asking me uh, earlier on uh, if I'd come back to radio. Um, if the terms are right. You are a legend. I know you know that, but one of the things that happens, I think, mm. take losing your anonymity. Okay. You'll never get used to that. Mm. I don't care who you are. Sure. You know, and, and you experience it most profoundly mm. when you are in a foreign country, when you're overseas, and you think, okay, finally I can melt into sure. the crowd. Sure, sure. And still there's a Chacharach South African who recognizes you. Happened to me in Thailand. I was so drunk. <laughs> you know, New York Times Square. Yeah. Piccadilly in Bali. Sure. There's always, because there's South Africans everywhere around mm. the world. Mm. But for the most part, you can never get used to losing your anonymity. Mm. It's the strangest thing. Sure. Equally, I think people find it difficult to understand the significance of their impact. Yeah, you might know it in terms of, I don't know, social media following or sponsorships mm. or, you know, brands that want to work with you. You've got a sense of it, obviously. But in terms of your influence, particularly on your peers mm. in your industry, you don't know half of the things you have done mm. in terms of your impact. Thank you very much. So thank you. And I appreciate that. In fact, I, my, my next question was actually regarding you on radio because I've followed your career since Channel O, 
or 25 years ago. You were sending us texts when I was doing early breakfast on 702 2005. Uh, yeah. 2006. Yeah. So I've been, like I said, um, um, uh, watching you. But maybe I'm wrong. I think you probably sound happiest and most comfortable in what you do right now than you've ever sounded before. There's an authenticity yes. that radio forces you to have. Sure. Otherwise, pack up and go home. Exactly. Um, I have said so many things that I had no intention mm. of saying on the radio, but because, and especially our format, where people, people phone you and they confess their secrets. Yes. Um, and they expose themselves. And, and, and if you can't be human, if mm. you can't be your full self on the radio, go do something else. Mm. Um, but I also i am operating at a time where many South Africans are struggling with uncertainty about what comes next. Mm. And what we try a lot to do with our show is to locate the conversations in what people are experiencing. Yes. We allow people to tell their story. Mm. And through those conversations, we give the audience a sense of the country. We are a real temperature gauge. Mm. So I can't depress people. And the thing that you can do in a moment of uncertainty is to allow people to be their authentic selves. Mm. And it's got to start with you. Okay, so I'm right then. <laughs> <laughs> What would you say the state of South Africa is right now on this day, this week? We are our worst critics. Mm. South Africans are almost best described as a little schizo. Mm. We can have one story dominate the news cycle and it's the worst thing that's ever happened. Mm. We win a World Cup and we're suddenly the best nation, the best country in the wow, world. Hugging. So we're a nation of extremes in terms of the reaction to things. So we're very passionate about everything. We are passionate about everything, but we are fortunate in the sense that we live in a country where we're allowed to be ourselves. Mm. We laugh at ourselves. We cry together. We hope together. Mm. We're scared together. One day, a mall is collapsing, partly, one suspects, because mm. cheap labor was being used with unqualified, likely undocumented foreign nationals. Mm. In another story, a five-year-old is shot mm. in the driveway trying to excitedly greet his father who is being hijacked. I mean, those are the extremes we live with in South Africa. Mm. But at the same time, we've got this young Grammy Award winning artist who was the talk of town at the Met Gala. Mm. You know, those, that's the daily mix, you know, of South African conversations and South African stories. Mm. And I think we're in a place where I would say things are probably not as bad as they seem, mm. but were they ever as good as we remember? Mm. If you were called in by the ANC, advise us, what should we do different to how we've been doing things? What would you say to the ANC? I went to a very dear friend's father's funeral. Mm. We were in the village in the back of beyond somewhere in Kofimvab. Mm. And, you know, rural funerals, it's all happening within the homestead. And, you know, the service carried on as is normal. And then mm. at the end, the MC made announcements that when they came back from burying the body, mm. because we're all here, he says, we will then proceed with the local branch meeting of the ANC. Mm. That's one example. Mm. Perhaps the better example to illustrate my point is in the days after the Marikana massacre, we were there as a media contingent because Jacob Zuma, mm. the president of the Republic, was coming to address the families of the victims mm. of Marikana. 
This is literally days after. Still very raw. It is raw. Emotions mm. are heightened. And we walked into that meeting near the Kopi where it happened with no clear sense of whether there could be chaos mm. that would erupt. Jacob Zuma had come back into the country from Mozambique. Mm. You could hear a pin drop. And he says to the audience, I thought Jengom Zali as a parent, mm. in that way, that masterful way that really only Jacob Zuma can do, that I must come and hear what you have to say. Mm. I must come and see you for myself. But unfortunately, I have urgent government business in Mahikeng. Yeah, he went to the northwest. Remember, I'm yeah. on my way to Mahikeng. Mm. And I looked around. Mm. And I thought, this is insane. What could be more urgent mm. than what has just happened? Under your government, mm. there wasn't a murmur of objection, mm. of hurt, of mm. shock. They believed him. Mm. They accepted him. His presence was enough. Mm. That's how deep and profound mm. the love of the ANC is in South Africa. That even when people are in the depths of their grief, mm. ANC leaders just have to show up. Mm. What would I advise them? Mm. To remember that. Mm. To stop taking it for granted. Mm to show some humility. Because one day it will stop. It will. Mm. And that, that dividend is fast running out, as all the polls indicate. Mm. But the feeling of wanting the ANC to succeed mm. is still something that's a very big feature of our politics and the calculations people make when they think about who they want in power. And you see it on a lot of these door-to-doors. That on the street, the love is still... Just today or yesterday, there was mm. an article, mm. an opinion piece, where the writer was upset mm. that the ANC is making fools of our people mm. because there was this convoy. And I think in there was, you know, um, a, a Mercedes uh, GLS, I think, what do you call it? The, the G-Wagon. G-Wagon, yeah. yeah. And they were throwing, throwing t-shirts. T-shirts. I, I saw, I saw and it, this yeah. writer is upset. But... In the same article, mm. she concedes there was a man and a woman fighting over one of these T-shirts. Mm. And when the woman lost, she then tried to catch up mm. with the convoy mm. because she wants mm. a T-shirt. Mm. There's no other political brand mm. that has that kind of currency in South Africa. Sure. And if the ANC were to do what it claims and put people first, they would get their majority back like that. Advice to the DA. <laughs> you. Okay, I think that's advice enough. <laughs> you. I've interviewed Helen Zilla sure. many a time. Mm. There is no politician with mm. a thicker skin. You can't tell anything. She loves the fight. It's no accident yep. that her book, or one of her books, is called Not Without a Fight. Sure. And the tragedy of it is, you can't tell them anything. Yeah. Because you can't tell her anything. Absolutely. You know, um, she is a prophet mm. with honor in her own hometown. Sure. And there's none more dangerous. Finally, advice to the EFF. It almost feels arrogant to advise a party led by the most talented politician mm. of our generation, sure. of our time. Mm. The EFF will always have a ceiling mm. if it maintains what it did to establish itself. Okay. Julius Malema and the EFF have to grow up. Mm. They have to be more than revolutionaries. Sure. Their youth league era is over. Mm. There has to be a sense. South Africa is a conservative place. We want to find each other. Isn't that why maybe Juju's in suits a lot lately? 
and there is and, and has toned down even. There is speculation. We have seen him try to reach out to different communities. Mm. But ultimately, South Africans come together with a leader. We want a grown-up in charge. Mm. Mm. We want the sense that we will be okay. Sure. It's the very reason mm. black people in South Africa are so magnanimous. Mm. Were in 1996 and remain so even with the levels of poverty mm. and inequality that we have today. Mm. You know, it's the reason the domestic worker never smothered mm. the kids of the bus and the madam yes. who were abusing her. Absolutely. We need the grown-ups in charge. Mm. And, and, and the rhetoric of being radical of being extreme mm. is something that will always leave you on the political fringe. Julius Malema and the EFF will always get a lot of attention. Mm. But until they go for that middle center. That attention won't, won't turn into votes. Mm. No way. Moving away from politics, we're wrapping up because we're out of time and apparently this episode is a tad long and I had another hour to talk to you. <laughs> How would you advise someone that has decided, screw it, I'm now starting to be true to myself and my life, as uh, did happen with, uh, with, with yourself. And now you need to re-enter the dating game, but as your true self now. That kind of been an easy, it's the most fun I've been having for a long time. For real? Yeah. So what did marriage teach you about? I'm a relationship person, ah, ultimately. Lover of love. Um, I'm a lover of love. Hashtag love lives here. As many times, <laughs> as, many times as I have been beaten and bruised, I'm yeah. going to come back for more. Sure. I'm the guy who will post you. Yeah. We will hold hands. Sure. We will drink. Yeah, we saw the posts. And, and then, then they, they stop. come off. <laughs> <laughs> Dust yourself off and you try again. Um, we've only got one shot at this. Yes. You know. And don't stop trying. Don't stop trying. Yeah. Don't give up. Mm. Because also, for all those times it didn't work out. Sure. If I were to give up, mm. then it was what was it, what was the point? Sure. What was the point? I'll be a lover, not a fighter, till the day I die. What do you fear, though? Because on radio, on carte blanche, you're this fearless journalist. You're this fearless native that starts all the trouble. <laughs> what do you fear? When I interviewed the president, he said, oh, so you're the one who talks too much. Yeah, the, that native, that one. <laughs> um, I fear... I fear complacency. Mm. I fear it in my own work. I fear it for us as a country. Mm. South Africa has been that place where every time somebody has counted us out, every time somebody has said this is a basket case, yeah. we somehow find it in ourselves to pull together, to pull through. Sure. I fear that moment we run out of the proverbial nine lives because we thought we were an exception, mm. because we got too comfortable mm. in how many times we've come back from the brink. Mm. So we must not stop giving a damn. And this is why we do, it's why I do, I, it's sure. why I do what I do every mm. morning. Mm. Um, by creating that space mm. where information is shared, where views are discussed, sure. where things are exposed, where we have accountability interviews, mm. but we live life together. So, sure. For me, the, the, the central tenet of my work is mm. keeping myself sure. and keeping my country honest. And I think one of the reasons I'm an addict when it comes to your show is precisely that, that your show reminds us that we may differ in how we choose to parent or how we choose to even just... Uh, you know, fold a shirt if that's what it is. But your show reflects all of who we are so that we fully appreciate that the way you do things is not the only way. 
it's okay for other people to do things the other way too, but you must respect that. And you must actually fight to the death for their right to be different to how you are. There was a time in South Africa where the radio talk show host mm. had to know everything. Exactly. Had to be the authority mm. on everything. And have no opinion still. I have the best gig in the world. Yeah. I get to ask dumb questions, yeah. ostensibly on behalf of the audience. Yeah. But I, I say to people, my, the best description of my job is I get paid to learn. Absolutely. You could be a scientist, mm. you could be an inventor, you could be a hip hop artist, a poet, a writer. Mm. I get to ask you dumb questions. Mm. And somebody pays me for it? Yep. Are you kidding me? It's a good gig. <laughs> Bongs, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you for having me. Um, we, like I said, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I still have like a, maybe we can have a part two. <laughs> I was worried what the topic was going to be. I yeah. nearly actually asked you that. What, to send questions? No. Yeah. Just, so there's that, there's that Oprah interview. Yes. Where she's about to interview Mandela. Yes. And he says, so what are we talking about? Mm. And I thought he's probably aware of that story. So maybe he'll think but I genuinely had no idea what we would talk about. Mm. So thank you for having me. No, I wanted to have people see the human side of you. Uh, you know, like- Because what side do they see? Well, they see the- <laughs> The ratchet side. <laughs> they, see, they see the guy on a pedestal. They see the well-spoken, uh, the dictionary probably asks him for words, a radio dude. <laughs> and I wanted people to see this side that uh, you've uh, shared with us. And thanks for being candid. Thanks for being open and honest. I respect you too much to have been anything else. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Bongani Bingwa is about to leave the building so he can nap and be up for his show again the next morning as one. What time do you sleep, bro? Uh, these days, by 8 o'clock, I'm done. I'm Jeez. Out like a light. You're, you're like a, a new age John yeah, Robbie. No, I can't. I met John Robbie once at the chiropractor. Not chiropractor. We were at the physio. And uh, he was telling me that he's in bed at 6 or 7. No, at the time, quite, at the time. Yeah, yeah, no, he he was mean, like, he's in bed or six or seven, but at three, he's up reading every single newspaper that is out. Yeah. Every single day. The only time I don't pick up, and I'm talking about the physical paper, yes, yes. the only day of the week I don't read a newspaper is Saturday. Mm. Every single day. Every single day. Sunday to Friday. Yeah. There's a lot to be said about consistency, but we'll talk about that in the next uh, interview. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, wow, what an interview. We've had less than half a dozen guests, but it feels like we've covered a dozen areas. Hopefully you've picked up motivation to tackle some old things and maybe try some new things too. However, we at WOW take no responsibility for people avoiding you and your experiments with TV and radio presenting or your attempts at giving <laughs> massages. Hope you have fun anyway, and hope you'll have a wow week ahead. Coming to you from Amp Studios, we're part of the Africa Podcast Network. Shout out Pezulu Works for all of the cinematography, all of the imaging by artist The Flow Fraser, and our guests today, Kia Mufukeng. Her book is out. Get that book. It will blow your mind. And Bongani Bingwa. Creative producer Kuvesh Mohan and show producer Kelezo Mudisa King. Email us at waw at africapodcastnetwork.com. Till next week, have a great week in spite of yourselves.